بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رب الشهر في صدر ويسر لي أمري وعلى الأفضة من الثانية فقو قولي رب الزيد إلما um, جزاك الله خير نبيون for joining us once again to our weekly um, uh, gathering in, of, on Tuesday nights unpacking our stories and a study of Surah Yusuf with a focus on specifically looking at how when as we appreciate the story, the best of stories that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, that we're able to unpack some of the details and concepts that exist in each of our stories as we're kind of going through life. Um, today we're going to try something kind of ambitious, and that is we're going to try to get through um, ayat 7 through 14 or 13 if we can. No, we're going to try to get to 7 through 14, inshallah. So two whole conversations. Um, uh, even though I know the last couple of weeks, the first time we were together, we literally went through an introduction to the story. Ayat one through three, we focus on this this being an Arabic Quran. What's, what does it mean when it says the best of all stories? What is the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling stories in the Quran? That's a lot of what we'd focused on the first week. The second week, what we got into was this intimate conversation between a young, uh, between a boy and his father and what beautiful environment was created, what a parent-child relationship really should look like that leads to this productive um, human being, being being formed. And that's what we focused on last week was uh, um, Yusuf Aysam talking to his father. And we also, I wanted us to set the scene in a way that um, the story of Yusuf Aysam and his father, it's almost, we're used to the idea of archetypal stories. And the example I think I gave last week was um, his father empowers him by saying, first listening to him and being a really good active listener and then responding with what to do in the present, what to do in the future to look forward to you have been chosen. There's a huge responsibility. Allah has chosen you. So all of that stuff about the future and you are a part of a legacy, connecting him to his legacy of Abraham, of Isaac. So his great grandfather and his uh, grandfather, and then even himself of Ali Yaqub, even his own children. Um, so this idea of like connecting him really orienting this young man from the uh, uh, from his in his present, his future and his past and really making him feel super important. Um, I was I've been thinking about that a lot this week as I was going through of like, hmm, every movie has that, uh, you know, that call to action mo moment. Um, this would be uh, Mufasa talking to Simba saying everything the light touches is your uh, kingdom, right? It's this whole idea of like, there's a conversation that the protagonist has with who they look up to. And that's, um, I, I, uh, um, so, and that is the idea of uh, kind of Yaqub Aysam talking to Yusuf Aleyhisselam. We also talked about, this is like that moment in like Bruce Wayne has a fond memories of what? Of his father. Bruce Wayne has these fond memories of his father um, uh, telling him, why do we fall, Bruce, so that we can learn to pick ourselves back up. And it'll be something he talks about for the rest of his life or becomes the motto of his life. That exact same way, Yusuf is being prepared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, and the means is through Yaqub to like, this is how you're going to remember. You're going to struggle a lot through life. You're going to be chosen. We talked about the word ijtiba'a, but through all of it, know what? Allah chose you and he connects it directly. Like you don't do anything because I'm telling you to, you do something because you are going to be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will hold you accountable. So that's kind of the introductions of where we are with that story. We've had that first um, conversation today. We're going to get into two additional conversations. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen so we're back onto the Quran. Um, so today we're going to talk about Ayah 7, 8, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and possibly 14 if we can get to it, inshallah. And it captures two basic conversations. Um, the first of which, which is Yusuf's brothers all talk with each other. So that's the first conversation we're going to capture. And then the second conversation we're going to capture um, inshallah, is when the uh, Yusuf's brothers talk to their father. So when they talk to Yaqub alayhi salam, um, and kind of a lot of the themes that are found within it. Today, our conversation is going to deal with sibling rivalry, is going to deal with, is it so evil to want your father to love you? Most of us would say, no, that doesn't seem like a very quote unquote evil thing to be done. But is that so evil? Um, what is a proper way of dealing with feelings uh, of unease in a, in a family situation and what are improper ways of dealing with it. And then we're eventually going to even get into um, 
how could brothers get to the point where they're willing to do what? Kill or cast out their own brother? These are some of the, the overarching themes that we're gonna be dealing with. I'm gonna start with a quick recitation and a quick reading of the verses, and then we're gonna go through verse by word, verse. Um, just as inshallah, we've established as of our sunnah as of this group. Um, those of you who are joining us for the first time, I, I see you there, um, a couple of you. I won't mention you by name, inshallah. Uh, welcome. Um, and this is also meant to be a discussion, inshallah, with all of you. So as we're unpacking these themes, whatever reflections you come up with are, are definitely welcome um, in, in, in through our discussion today, inshallah. But beginning with ayah number seven, remember, this is right after Yusuf, Ali, the scene has ended of Yusuf alayhi salam talking to Yaqub. So beautiful father-son conversation. Just like in movies, oftentimes you'll have like this beautiful, it's what, what happens right after Mufasa and Simba talk? Do you know who it cuts to? It cuts to Scar talking to the hyenas, right? Not that I'm calling, nice job, Moise. Not that I'm calling necessarily the uh, brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam the hyenas, but it will be this idea of there's always a, a this things are right, and then there's the other side of the other side is conspiring, and that's where we start off. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "لقد كان في يوسف وإخوته آيات للسائلين." There are lessons in the story of Joseph and his brothers for all those who seek, for anyone who questions. The brothers said to each other, although we're many strong ones, Joseph and his brother are dearer to our father than we are. Our father is clearly in the wrong. One of them says, kill Yusuf or throw him out. And our father's attention or our father's face will finally be free to look at us. After that, all of, uh, all of us can be righteous. All of you can be righteous. One of them said, don't kill him. Don't kill Joseph. But throw him in the hidden parts of a well so that maybe some traveling caravan can pick him up. They said to their father, why don't you trust Yusuf with us? We wish him well. Send him with us tomorrow. He'll be able to play and eat. And we'll take good care of him. Father responds, He replies, I thought you were taking, the, the very thought of you taking him away from me worries me a lot. I'm afraid that maybe the wolf may eat him when you're not attention. If a wolf ate him when we're a strong group around him, we would definitely be losers. That's the entirety of the ayat that we're going to be going through today. Again, it's two conversations. First conversation, the brothers amongst themselves. Second conversations, the brothers and their father. That's the two scenes we're really going to be focusing on. Any quick reflections before we dive in Aya to Aya? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam Allah. I was thinking, you know, this whole, um, did these passages remind me of the Ayahs in Surah Tariq? Um, the last two Ayahs, oh, the last, like the last three Ayahs, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Fayakid, wait, uh, Fayakid, 
وسماء ذات الرجع والأرض ذات الصدع إنه لقول فصل ما هو بالهزل فيكيد دون كيدا right وأكيد كيدا so it's like it's almost like they're the brothers of the people who plan and but then this whole story is about like Allah subhanahu wa taala planning something for Yusuf alayhi salam yeah definitely and it, it also i want us to think about it contrasting last week right last week young boy who's really scared so what happens father goes it's going to be all right you're going to suffer a lot through life just like your grandparents did your great-grandparents did but allah has an awesome plan for you allah has chosen you what are they doing kind of the opposite oh man this is happening what are we going to do about it next um it's almost as if that party is planning and this party is planning and we get to now see which one is Allah's plan. Um, I actually find it funny when we, I, I find myself even reflecting, not which one is Allah's plan. The way we're supposed to look at it is both of them combined are Allah's plan. But that, that's also captured in Yakidu Nakeda, wa Akidu Kaida. Allah's plan includes their plan, but it's bigger than they're just theirs. I also think it's like that. So um, you know, technically we all know that like Allah is always watching us. Um, but when we're like doing something wrong or like something is sinning, we like don't feel his presence as much. Even that's like a really bad thing, but it's like kind of true. We don't feel his presence as much. Um, and same thing with like the brothers when they were talking about like you know they were like planning against him. They think like they thought like nobody was hearing their conversations, but now like their whole conversation you know it's, it's like documented in the Quran. Even though like at the moment it's all like oh like nobody's listening to it or like nobody knows about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's a really important point. This also tells us why this is the best of stories, um, because a good story gives you insight that you wouldn't be able to get if it was like a rumor. Like there's a difference between a story and like a news report, right? News reports will tell you what was verifiable by what. It was verifiable by like some outside party. What is Allah capturing? You know that secret conversation they had, the one that no one they thought no one could hear. Well, we start off the story by three of those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Anyone else? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, assalamu alaikum. I find it interesting that it's explicitly mentioned that there are lessons in the story when everything in the Quran serves as a lesson. So I think the fact that it's explicitly mentioned just accentuates the importance of every minute detail in the story. Definitely. Every detail has guidance for us, specific guidance for us. Um, and actually, that's that's a great segue, Mariam, into what getting into the first ayah itself. Allah starts off after the first scene, interrupts the story and says, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتُ لِلسَّائِلِينَ There are lessons in the story of Yusuf and his brothers for all those who seek. I find this to be really, really interesting because this has already been said. What I mean by that is Allah started off saying like we're narrating the best of stories in the best of ways and in it is guidance for people who listen. Right? Allah already said that. But then Allah goes, no, no, no. You better realize in the story of Joseph and his brothers, there's lessons for everyone who seeks. I want us to really think about why would Allah do that? The first thing I can think of is normally if there, a story was called Surah Yusuf, the story of Yusuf. What's going to be obvious that most of us think is who are we who are we going to be getting lessons from? The obvious it, what answer is Yusuf, alayhi salam, right? But I love that Allah subhanahu wa taala. This is just my conjecture, but Allah says it's not just Yusuf, ikhwatihi, and his brothers. Most of us, when we think about a story, who do we think we relate to the most? The protagonist. Right? What do we start saying? Oh, I'm just like Yusuf. But I, what are the, I, I personally see this as almost a jab at us that you could very well be the brothers. You're not just, this story doesn't just apply to you because you are possibly Yusuf, which you could be. You could also be the antagonist. The Quran doesn't only paint protagonists. You actually have just as complex psychological analysis of the antagonist in the Quran of Pharaoh as you do about Moses. Pharaoh is talked about not as many times, but almost as many times as Moses. Abraham, Ibrahim is talked about, but Ibrahim's father is talked about. Lut is talked about, but Lut's people, Lut's wife is talked about. Um, 
the Quran doesn't just capture heroes, it also captures villains because we have to, that, there's lessons in them too. I just find that to be just really interesting that Allah has to put that forward. And it's kind of like what I said last week of, you're not supposed to be looking at these ayat and just being like, oh man, yeah, this is why my family's bad. I'm like the abused child, right? No, it's supposed to be more along the lines of, look at the other people in your life who Allah has blessed you with. Maybe I'm the brothers of Yusuf to my sibling, to my cousin, to my parents, to my whomever it will be, um, we could be a villain <laughs> um, in, in, in the scenario. And there's lessons even for that because the Quran isn't just there to, for, to push good people into further good. It's also those who are not involved in the greatest things, pull them out of it. It's going to be techniques. You might be heading down this road, but you can stop yourself. Not just It's not just for, um, quote unquote, the heroes. Uh, and, and the other part I see is significant is uh, ayatu, ayatun signs for lissa'ideen, the ones who ask. This whole surah, one of the ways we understand it was revealed is they asked the question about Joseph. The Quraysh asked the question about Joseph because why? Uh, they wanted to disprove uh, the prophet of, of the Prophet ﷺ. For those who ask, so it's for them. But the other is sa'il is also someone who begs. Like if they, a sa'il in the Quran is also described as the one who needs charity, like give to the sa'il, why? Because um, you, you feel so much in a need, you have to ask for it. Um, I personally see this of any story in the Quran, our approach to it is we're supposed to be sa'ilin. We are supposed to recognize we need it. That in this, in this story are lessons for those who need it. So we need to actually go into it and understand that we actually need lessons. Every single time I open up the Quran and specifically every time I open up Surah Yusuf and the, read the stories of Yusuf or the characters in the Quran, I need to hear their story right now because there is definitely guidance in it for me. Any reflections on ayah number seven? I see some really cool direct messages at me in the chat. Um, Jazakallah khairan, guys. But if, with your permission, I'd, I'd love to open that up for, for everyone. So those that message me directly, I, I don't mind if you share it, uh, um, if you feel comfortable. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum uh, salam, so Walid. Really quick, I think the reason people are doing that is because uh, the chat is disabled to send it to everyone. Oh, it is? Yep, yep. That is my mistake. Interesting, let me just fix that then. Good catch. I don't know if you did that like intentionally or if that was like um, just like a default person. I think that might have been the default. So Jazakallah Khan for catching that will lead. Just in case people were purposefully messaging me directly, <laughs> uh, feel free to write it out again <laughs> to me if, if you meant it uh, for it to be sent to everyone. Okay. Um, any reflections on ayah number seven? If not, I'm going to move on because we do have, alhamdulillah, close to seven ayat that we're planning on uh, getting through today, which would be a new record for us as a group. Uh, Waleed, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Yeah, so I think you touched upon it briefly, but it says in the Quran, well, you said in the Quran, um, there are not many places where Allah will say that there are lessons for those who seek them, are there any other other uh, instances in the Quran where something like this occurs? Yes, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will say in other places. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the in the major lessons are for the people who ask, but there seems to be lessons for others as well. Um, so there are similar wordings in the Quran, but not in this exact combination. This is the general of just ask. There are signs in it. Other places it'll say there are lessons that make you cry. Other places it'll say there's guidance for those who ask. But I believe this is the only place where it says there are literal signs for those who ask. Okay, Jazakumullah okay. khair. Wait, yeah. Then we're going to move to the next uh, ayah, ayah number eight, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the brothers said to each other, remember Allah captures that small gathering, um, and what do they say to each other? Uh, Yusuf and his brother are more beloved. They're more beloved to our brothers than we are. 
when we're strong. Man, there's a lot going on here. And Allah is touching on, in my opinion, one of the most fundamental human realities. Um, I'm actually going to allude to this being more than just a human reality. This is just going to be a creature reality, alluding to the story of Shaytan and, uh, and, and Adam alayhi salam as well. In the beginning of, uh, of um, the creation as we've, we understand it from the Quran. Um, but the brothers are saying, man, Yusuf and his brother. So we already get a third character who's introduced now. Yusuf alayhi salam had a younger brother named Ben Yamin. These two are significantly younger than the rest of the brothers. And we get through biblical uh, sources and through Hadith literature that why this took place is because they were actually from a different mother. Um, there's differences of opinion of how many different mothers there were that uh, um, the brothers of Yusuf experienced. So what I mean by that is there's a difference of opinion where there are two wives, where there are three wives, where there are four wives. We're just going to say that there's one who 10 brothers are from. And then there's another who two are from, even though there are differences of opinion that the, the 10 didn't come from one mother, they came from two or three. But I don't think that detail matters all that much, at least for the conversation. They're like, hey, we're the older ones. We're the ones, and they seem to say, we're the capable ones. Usba is literally like, we're a gang. We're a, we're a force to be reckoned with. That's the idea of Usba, right? That, uh, and it makes sense because they're farmers. Yusuf and his family are farmers. And in a farm, you kind of earn your place. And what I mean by that is like, everyone has certain chores that they're assigned to and you get good at your chore and also you become known for your chore. And they're like, we know our place. We, our dad has trained us. Our dad has given us all unique tasks to take on. And we take all of those on, but our father still seems to prefer those, those two. Our father is clearly wrong. A couple of interesting points here. And I'm going to contrast this a lot with the conversation that took place before uh, with Yusuf and his father. Yusuf, alayhi salam, remember in the la last week when we were discussing this, he gets freaked out because of a dream. And immediately, because part of him interpreting the dream was, he's like, I'm going to be away from my father and my brothers? He goes right to his father and like has that conversation with him. These guys, what do they do? They're like, hey, we have a problem. But instead of addressing the root of the problem, what would the root of the problem be? Go to our father and say, hey, dad, kind of feel like you like Yusuf and Benjamin more than us. Instead of doing that, what do they decide to do? Our father's wrong. There's no challenge. There's no getting a clarification. There's nothing. They take it into their own hands. And we're not going to get to the next ayah just yet because what they come to is pretty ridiculous. The, the consensus they all kind of form, kill him or cast him out. We're going to get there in a second. But just like the, the mindset is different here. It's not open a line of communication to figure out how to deal with our feeling. Because Yusuf has a feeling too. Yusuf's feeling is what? I'm scared. When you're scared, what do you do? You talk about it with your father. These guys, they have a feeling, which is what? Where I feel like, you know, we're not, we're not getting the appropriate love. We're not getting the appropriate attention as everyone else, as these two. Our father's clearly wrong. A feeling turns into a fact rather than a feeling gets discussed to address or arrive at a fact. Do you hear the difference between the two? Yeah. I think that's a major kind of element here is they talk amongst each other about something that doesn't, that involves someone else. Yusuf salam, and his father, Yusuf is like, I'm scared. So he talks to his father in order to get clarification and arrives at what to do in the future. He involves the parties that are kind of there. Um, so I think it's just like an interesting kind, uh, parallel. And the other thing, the reason I, I really brought this up of um, why it's, I, I use the term, this is what creatures just feel, this rivalry, because this we could say is the exact same thing of, in our uh, tradition, the first story that's narrated in the Quran is the story of Iblis, of Shaytan, and Adam alayhi salam, in which Shaytan does something similar. And the proof I'm going to use for this is, Ad, uh, in the creation story in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the angels already exist, Iblis already exists, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates Adam alayhi salam, Who's the first person to question Allah? 
Is it Iblis? No, it's not. The angel? The angels. The angels ask the question first, right? Iblis doesn't ask a question. The angels say, hey, uh, based on our calculations, from our understanding of this thing you've put forward in front of us, we've seen stuff like this on Earth before. There's humanoid looking things on Earth. And all they do is cause bloodshed and corruption on the Earth. The angels look at Adam and they make a deduction and they say, by the way, why are you doing this? They don't say it in that way, but you get my point. They ask Allah that question and Allah responds to them. And the angels, they're not seen as having done anything wrong. Does Iblis ever ask a question? No, he acts before he asks the question. The brothers, do they ever ask their father, hey, is it true you love him more than us? No, they act on their assumption. Iblis acts on his assumption. Asking a question is actually praised. And opening up a line of communication is praised. Not doing so and letting your own weaknesses come out and acting on your weaknesses, on your jealousy, that's problematic. One of the things that's really established here. The other thing is, what they say is pretty interesting. It's almost the same thing as what Iblis says. وَنَحْنُ أُسْبَتُونَ أُسْبَتُونَ means like we're mighty. We're this, like, uh, one, of my, one of my teachers would use to describe it. Uh, he used a lot of like very flowery city language. And he used to be like, we're a gang. We're like, we're tough, right? Like he, he used to use these type of terms for it. But it, what it really does is it captures usba is we're physically strong. Yusuf salam and Ben Yamin, they're young kids. Can they be physically strong in comparison to a bunch of teenagers? No, they can't, right? It's kind of like Shaytan when Shaytan talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, وَبِمَا um, You set me into the wrong. Ana, uh, min. I'm better than him. خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَارُ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن تِينَ خَلَقْتَهُ مِن تِينَ this idea, Shaytan says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what? And that's in the creation story. You created me from fire and you created them from clay. I'm better. What are they saying? We're strong, we're better. What did Iblis never say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we only created from clay? We are created from clay. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But what else are we created from? A soul? What happened to the soul thing that Allah blew into Adam alayhi salam and taught him the names of everything, right? There's a lot more information than just being created from clay, but that doesn't fit Shaytan's narrative. So it's omitted. Kind of like here, we're strong. Nahnu usbatun, physically strong. What about, how about like, Yusuf probably has more characteristics. Does our father love him because he's weak? No, our father probably loves him because he's kind and caring and we're not. He's spiritually inclined and we just seem to beat each other up all the time. He's, there's probably a bunch of other qualities of Yusuf, but none of that gets mentioned. What gets mentioned? We're strong. He's not. He, omitting the information that's there. And then the next thing they say, Inna abana lafi mubin. Our father's clearly in the wrong. We could never be wrong. Just like Iblis. Iblis tells Allah, Allah, you're wrong. You created me from this. You created like they do the same thing. Our father's wrong. You're wrong. There's no discussion. There's no question to be had. He's clearly wrong. The psychology here to me is just very fascinating. Um, my apologies. I've been talking for a while. What do you guys think when you read this ayah? Yeah, I think the whole communication aspect is really interesting because I never thought of it as like relevance in this story. Like I read the story a few times, but I never thought of like the whole communication part, like how important that is and how they were just assuming. And like, it reminds me of myself too. Cause like oftentimes like my friends like behave differently. Like I, like I assumed that, oh, they must be like, they must have like a change of heart or like they must be thinking something different when instead I could just like talk to them about it and like ask them like, what's up? Cause just seeing like how like often like it is for easy, it is easy for us to just make assumptions. And it's kind of like, um, like worsen something instead of bettering it by communication. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's a very strong point. Um, I saw two hands go up. I know Aisha's hand is up, but someone raised their hand beforehand too. Oh, 
Was it was it used for bun? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I kind of like have similar thing what she said. Um, the um, I guess the concept of jumping to conclusion really fast. Um, I kind of do that too sometimes. Not sometimes, a lot of times. Uh, with almost every problems that I face, I kind of create a scenario in my own head that didn't even happen, and I let my anxiety get the best of me. So over here, you can like emphasize on the fact that um, how the fact that they jumped to conclusion and without even having a clarification with their dad, um, they made, a, I guess like that kind of led to a huge sin where he, they like kind of um, hurt their little brother and everything. So, so yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. Aisha? Yeah, um, I know last time I mentioned that like my sister is like much younger than me. And, and when I think about this passage, sometimes I think about how the relationship that I have with my mother is so much more different than the relationship my sister has with my mother. So I, I I'm like, I can see like, you know, like that kind of things within like m misunderstandings, but then they can also be clarified with like questions as well and how important asking questions are and, you know, addressing how you're feeling and getting those out in the open when you have misunderstandings with, with someone like your parents. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Instead of like, that's the, the issue of like when an assumption stays in your own head, it doesn't just, it evolves when it's in your head. Like it doesn't, it's not like, oh, I observed this today. And like, it's not like that observation will just stay there. That observation turns into, it's because they did this. It's because they did this. How dare they? They always do this. Like it starts turning into this weird thing rather than just addressing the situation at hand. So yeah, like getting it out oftentimes, producing it in um, uh, to the people involved is the best way to go about it. Um, rather than unfortunately what oftentimes takes place, which is stays in our head for so long that it a, a terrible conclusion is, is taken out. But an argument could be made here that, um, well, aren't they talking to each other? Is, aren't they doing what you're supposed to? You're supposed to talk to people? But actually there's an issue. This also comes down to um, company. There are certain times in which talking to people is super helpful. And then there are certain times in which people when they're together are dumber than when they are uh, by themselves. Like the general understanding we have is synergy, right? More people together, we get smarter as a whole. But there's a dark side to synergy and that's mob mentality. What happens? You have a group of, you have, if you had a single person and you were talking to them, you'd come up with a reasonable conversation at the end of it. A group of people who are all emotionally charged, there's no conversation to be had, what'll happen? Yelling, the capital riots, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like some of the worst things ever start taking place. Why? If you talk to each of them individually, I'm sure there, there might be some reason to be had, but put a bunch of emotional people together, there's no reason to be had there. Their worst ideas float to the top rather than the best ideas floating to the top. Um, because what does it become? It's the one that expresses all of our emotions at the same time. That's the one that comes out. That's exactly what we see next. They come together and they say this. The first bad idea they have is our father is clearly wrong. That's the first bad idea they have. The second bad idea we have is in the next ayah, Uqtulu Yusufa, let's kill him. I almost guaranteed if there were any two people instead of a group, if someone said that, one would be like, whoa, 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 man, calm down. Like, that's a weird thing to say. But there's a group of them, all of them who have a slightly shared sentiment Suddenly, if you're the reasonable one, you're, you're the one no one wants to be around. I, I got a message from one of you. Could it be that they jumped to conclusions because they didn't want to clarify fears of seeming inferior compared to the Prophet uh, Yusuf Aysam? Yeah, so they just decided to act on their own um, because they didn't want to deal with their shortcomings. Yeah, I, there's probably a degree of arrogance here. Of they don't want to admit it. They don't want to acknowledge that Yusuf maybe has something that they don't have. And instead of dealing with that or becoming vulnerable, we could call this um, being very toxically, like being very like have the elements of toxic masculinity here of what I don't want to deal with these things that might make me feel inferior or like 
our dad loves him more. So instead of dealing with it, what are we going to do? We're just going to act. So yeah, I think that could be it. It's their own insecurities that actually keeps them from processing this appropriately. Yeah, that's there as well. But there's also that annoying group thing that takes place of mob mentality, let's just kill him. The worst ideas rise to the top. And that specifically happens. I think a lesson that all of us can really take here is friends are great oftentimes, but friends can lead you to, or people, friends or people you treat like friends, sometimes siblings you treat like friends, they can be amazing for you. Like they're good checks against your worst tendencies, but they could also be pushing you towards your worst tendencies. And we get an example, we got two examples here. There's a friendship between a father and a, uh, as, and a son, and that was beautiful. What? Son is insecure, father goes, it's okay, it's okay. God chose you, it's a beautiful interaction. There's another one, sons all feel insecure. They're all like, none of them individually would have done said something so stupid, but all of them collectively are dumber than each one of them individually. And this is the idea of also friendship of you need friends who can challenge you, not friends who are just gonna just push you along every single time. Um, we did a talk for MSA a little bit ago. I think MSA last week or two weeks ago was so the, the topic was on friendship. And that's one of the things we talked about is one of the levels of friendship is actually uh, Sidq of truthfulness. And that's the idea that it's a friend who challenges you. It's a friend who speaks the truth to you, whether it's convenient or it's inconvenient. These brothers don't necessarily represent this for each other. They represent like, or whatever you say, just keep going. They just push it forward. It's like that yes man mentality. And that leads to some of the worst um, uh, tendencies within people uh, ever uh, possible. Chapman, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't Benjamin also thrown down the well? That's a very good question. Um, one could be they had an ounce of decency in like, you can, it's, you can blame a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old, but you can't blame a two-year-old. Like many of me must have been really young at this point. So that's one reason. And another is uh, Yusuf became the scapegoat. Um, because you have to take your anger out on, one, uh, on something, right? Rather than two. So that's why it became Yusuf. It would practically not be possible to do something to both of them because the other one's too young. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say about this, even though there's so much more analysis we can do of this ayah is uh, they don't want to admit their own weakness. So they have to scapegoat it. Yusuf when he's feeling insecure, he doesn't understand. And that seems to be the conversation he has with father. I don't get it. These guys, it, we're not at fault because there's two ways that conversation could have went. Our father doesn't seem to notice us. We should work extra hard. And then they all start working extra hard. They all get their father's love. Like that's one way the conversation could have went. No, but that's not what happens. Yusuf's the issue. The issue is not us. They're not strong enough to figure out that the issue is us. Issue must be Yusuf. So they immediately kind of go outward rather than our self-reflection. And that's, that's the other thing of to know whether you're in good company or bad company. Uh, good company asks you to look inward first. Whether that's eventually the solution or not, that's what they ask you to do first. Bad company immediately scapegoats it because you can never be wrong. I also have a question. Mm -hmm. Why did the father not show their other, like the, these brothers equal love? There's a couple of opinions on this. The biblical opinion, and what I mean by biblical opinion, in the Israeliyat, the, pro the companions of the prophet and others would actually consult the, the Jews and Christians about this narrative. Um, and one thing was put forward that Jacob made a mistake and Jacob did actually favor um, Yusuf and Benjamin more than he favored uh, the sons. Um, from my understanding, actually, Yaqub in the Quran is described as an amazing parent, that he actually did show them all equal love. But this is where I'll say, um, I have two kids right now. Um, one who's four and one who's six months. I can tell you that I try my very best to be awesome to both of them. I don't think I mess up too badly, but inevitably my four-year-old, when I'm giving attention to the six-month-old, starts acting like a baby. She starts demanding my attention. She gets mad when I pick him up because she wants to be picked up too, even though she generally doesn't like being picked up because she can run around and she doesn't want to be immobilized, right? It's not, we don't have any confirmation that the statement that they made was actually true. It's how they felt. 
the father probably was. I mean, think about even like how you treat a little kid is different than how you treat an older kid, right? Like even a good parent, uh, of course, a good parent does that. Like, I don't, I, I, well, I mean, this is a bad example, but like how I play with my son is like, I mash my face into his body and just like move it around and he's cracking up throughout and like pulling my hair out. Like, like that's our idea of a good time. I guess I could still technically do that to my daughter. It was like, who's four? And sometimes I end up doing something similar. Um, but like, I can imagine when they're teenagers, that'd be a weird thing to do to them. Like you're supposed to show love differently as age goes on. Um, and, but they're seeing it and they're thinking, this means he loves us less. It's their feeling, it's not the actual truth. That's what I tend to uh, um, uh, see this as. Uh, Aisha wrote, I think that's human nature though, even though we don't like the attention, we, when we see someone else giving someone else attention, we also crave that. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I've actually even noticed, weirdly enough, the same thing from my six month old to my four year old. When I'm giving my four year old attention, he starts like demanding it, <laughs> even though he's only six months old. That's, that's what kids at the end of the day really want, um, is just that. Um, Wait, Chaplin, one more thing actually. Yeah. This is kind of reminiscent of a conversation I had with my mom. And she told me that, you know, parents generally speaking, try their hardest to give, you know, equal attention and love, even in different ways to their kids. But if one child shows that they're kind of closer to you in some way, then you kind of tend to naturally feel an inclination towards them. Mm -hmm. And we can clearly see that Yusuf Salam really trusted his dad. He had like this kind of friendship bond with his father, whereas the other brothers tend to kind of just automatically assume the dad is in the wrong. He immediately went to his dad and, you know, tried to clarify what that dream meant because he knew he could trust him. He, he had established that relationship of trust and respect. And I yeah. think when a child shows that to you, I mean, parents also want to be loved by their children. It doesn't just go the other way. So I think that the dad could have, you know, Yaqub salam could have also felt a certain way toward Yusuf salam because Yusuf salam is letting him in. That's true. And I, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a very um, logical explanation. The only reason I, I hesitate to um, completely confirm that is we're told that our belief of prophets is that they are the pinnacle of what a human being is capable of. And the pinnacle would be closest to equality, of course. And I think you're, you're actually hitting on a really strong point, which is it's impossible to be completely equal. Like that is an impossibility because of just the nature of children, right? They respond differently. There's also, there's two people communicate, if they communicate in a similar way, they're going to get closer than two people who have a very different language of communication, right? Yusuf Aysam and Yaqub maybe just spoke very similarly. So because of that, they were connected more. So it's not that there's no fault attributed to Yaqub, but it just could be that the, the feeling that the siblings got, the other siblings got was he's not as close to us. This actually brings me to another point though. And that is that uh, we're also supposed to appreciate here that um, your environment does dictate to an extent how you're gonna turn out, but doesn't completely control it. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is you would think everyone seems to have this narrative that like, hey, good environments lead to awesome people. Did the brothers of Yusuf have a good environment to grow up in? They were in a household with a prophet who was, their grandfather was a prophet who they may have interacted with too. Their brother is a prophet, yet things like this can still happen what's about to take place. So it's this idea that like environments matter, but there is even in perfect quote unquote environments, sometimes some negative things can take place as well. Um, because that's just the nature, kind of how human nature works as going back to uh, kind of what Aisha said, like that's human nature, like turmoil and strife will eventually strike at some point. And that's part of the human condition. Um, because it's 6.45 already and we have <laughs> close to five ayat left, I'm gonna start uh, um, jumping through the next ayah, inshallah. Uqtulu Yusuf. Now this is when it gets dark. That same conversation is going on. Kill Yusuf. Awitrahu. Uh, or banish him to another place. Um, and this is what they then say. And our father's attention wa uh, um, what's the term they use? Uh, yakhlu lakum wajhu abikum. 
um, that our father's attention will finally be to us. Our father's like, ignoring us. Our father can't see us because he's been blinded by Yusuf. Interesting use of words right there. Why? Because what happens to Yaqub in the story? He literally becomes blind. They think our father is blinded by Yusuf. What actually happens to Yaqub? He becomes blind because Yusuf is taken away. So their plan backfires completely. What did we want our father to see us? What does it turn into? Our father can't even see us anymore. He doesn't, he physically loses the ability to see us, which is eventually going to take place. But anyway, um, but what the kunu min ba'di qawman salihin. And we can be after that an amazing people. The whole thing of how many evil deeds were done with good intentions. What are they saying? Just a little bit. We just have to do this one bad thing and then we're going to be awesome. One bad thing. We already talked about mob mentality. How uh, the worst ideas come up when a bunch of passionate people are together. They need voices of reason. Their father was the voice of reason, but what did they say to him? He's clearly wrong. We don't need to worry about him anymore. Kill him. Throw him away into some strange land. And then our father's face will finally be towards us. And what? Uh, right after we do this one thing, we're doing it for him. We're going to be awesome afterward. There's so much that can be said here. Of how many times is it the mentality exactly what Sajila just wrote? It's the common mentality of sin. One last time and then I'll change. Sometimes people will be in a relationship that they know is bad for them. One more night, one more night together, one more text, one more this, and we'll be awesome. Like the Ramadan is coming up, and a lot of people are going through this if they're in like a haram relationship. They're like, we're going to talk like crazy. Why? Because for the entirety of Ramadan, we're going to be away from each other. Like, That's, how she, that's the, literally the plan of shaitan. Shaitan's plan is what? Adallu like, lakum. Like, he's going to be there pulling you from, from like, uh, what's the term that's used? Uh, pulling you with a string. Like, one more thing. One more step. One more step. Um, that, that's the whole idea of it, of how, how shaitan works. And then on the other side is actually a deeper psychological issue. And that is that um, it's the idea that the ends justify the means. Right, the idea of like, what's the end? We're going to be awesome people. Our father's going to love us, perfect. But how do we get there? By being terrible. Yeah, that doesn't work. The means are the end. Like the only thing you're ever going to be capable of is the means. The means will have changed you so much that that end will also change. The path you take matters. It's not just the destination, because. A bad path can never lead you to a good destination. Um, but that's where they go. Like, oh, that's, that's their justification for it. It almost sounds poetic and beautiful. What I mean by that is like, oh, we're just doing this because we want our father's love so that father can see us, right? That almost sounds poetic and beautiful. But when you think about like the, their approach, it makes no sense. That like the way we're gonna <laughs> attack on Titan reference, believe, good job. Um, you win today. Um, Aaron in a nutshell. Okay. Um, where was I going with this? Dang it, I got distracted. Oh, um, their father's gonna be happy with us. We're just gonna cut our father a little bit. We're gonna do something our father doesn't understand. We're gonna do something behind our father's back because it's actually good for him. There's, a, there's a, a high degree of arrogance here. Insecurity led to arrogance. Because what was it? Their version of, the fa of their father in their head, they are going to be good to that one rather than the father in front of them. Because what did they decide about their father? Our father deserves us. He doesn't deserve that scrawny kid Yusuf. He deserves us. He's going to be happier when what? When he's out of the way and he's going to have us. They're trying to please their father, but they're not trying to please the father who's in front of them. They're pleasing the father that's in their head. And that's a problem because that means they think they know their father than their father actually does. I've seen this so many times with people 
that they try to say that I'm obeying my parents, I'm disobeying my parents to obey my parents. <laughs> uh, that doesn't really work. You're, you're, you're falling into the same trap that the brothers of Yusuf fell into. Yeah, and there's so many things that can be said here where, yeah, I, I, you guys, how you're writing it is, is exactly that of like, we start sometimes say like, oh, I'm doing this because my parents didn't, weren't raised here. So rather than try to explain to my parents why the principles are, is what I'm following, I'm just going to make my own thing and say, well, I'm going to be awesome at the end of it. You're going to love the results at the end. Don't be like the brothers of Yusuf. Talk to your parents. Talk to your parents. <laughs> My name, that's really funny. I don't think I've ever heard Prophet Yusuf refer to as a scrawny kid. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's the other kind of thing of the justification that they use. Um, any Anyone have any uh, other comments to make on that, even though I know a lot can be said um, before I try? Oh, I'm still going to try my best to get to IO14. I had a comment, but it kind of takes it into like a different direction. Um, one thing that I like saw was that like typically when we see like somebody's like kids like misbehaving or like acting out in their like teenagehood, we think that their parents probably didn't raise them right or like there was like a shortcoming in their parents like you know raising. But like sometimes it's like a chill like a kid's behavior and their parents like um, upbringing has like nothing like it's like not related. Um, but I feel like I like I sometimes assume or like I have seen people assume like oh like they may have not been a good parent, you know, or like uh, they made, they probably didn't do as good as they should have. But that's like, you know, it's, it's shown the opposite here. Like the like prophet had like, you know, like really like um, sons that you wouldn't want to have. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a really, really strong point that especially in cultural, I don't want to call it, say cultural societies, but like societies that seem to like think that they're doing really well. They're like, there's no such thing as a bad child. There's only bad parents. And they start like judging parents if like, children are going through something difficult. I don't know why my voice turns into that, but anytime like, I'm talking about like stereotypical things, I get this weird, annoying, like nasal sound. <laughs> I just imagine I, I nose is high up. Um, but there's this thing of like, you blame the parents for this quote unquote sins of the kids. Like there's no, like they must have done something terrible. No, the story, that's part of the reason of stories in the Quran is we're supposed to become way less judgmental. Because are you going to talk bad about Yaqub? No. Allah praises Yaqub. You're going to talk bad about Yaqub, but his children still went through this immense test that they go through. So Shida, that's a very good point. That when we see someone going through a compromised situation, families going through compromising situations, um, if anything, part of us should be saying, subhanAllah, that trial, maybe they, they can be as amazing as the family of Yusuf alayhi salam. Like that should be our approach rather than like, oh, what do those parents do? What goes around comes around. Like all of those like random sayings that people say instead of that we're supposed to look at that and like that family could be like the family of yusuf this is how allah established yusuf this could be how allah is establishing them like we use it as an optimistic tale yeah so i appreciate you sharing that um i'm gonna continue uh, with the next ayah um another one of them said don't kill him um throw him into and the words that are used here throw him into not just a well. There's a couple of different words for well uh, in Arabic, but what's used here, um, jub is a well that like, you don't even put, it, it's a hole. <laughs> you know how like, imagine like a really cool looking well, the one that has like bricks around it, that thing on top with that rolly bucket thing. Take that, tear it down completely or back, uh, go back in time. Like before that, all of that cool stuff around it was built. What, what is a well then? It's just a hole. <laughs> a hole in which water seems to go down either because it leads to an aquifer of some sort, like some underground water, or people kept pouring water into it. Like they put a stream towards it. Um, that, that very few people know about. That's when you get to Jub. It's a well that not many people know about and they wouldn't go to unless they really needed it. Um, another example I could give for us in common day terms is... Um, there's a water fountain that's like temperature controlled, you know, like the one you go to a gym or like a school and you have this cool water fountain. And then there's the water fountain in the park that dogs use, <laughs> right? Or like you could use it, but like you really don't want to use it. Like that's, 
that's that water fountain, that would be the equivalent of that well. There's a well that everyone wants to use because it's well built. And then there's the well of like, man, you'd, you'd have to be really thirsty. Or like I've been traveled from really far away and not have access to water in order to use that. That's the well they say to throw him into. Um, one of them says, don't kill him, throw him in. Just throw him into that well. And ghayabati, uh, 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 um, the adjective that they use for it is a hidden well. That's one way of looking at it. Or the other one, hide him in the well. Throw him so deep into it that he, his words, people can't just randomly say uh, hear him. Because if you throw him into a normal well, it could be that he shouts out and guess what? People hear and they immediately find out, what happened to you? No, throw him into one, people won't find out that he's been thrown in there. There are two, two or three opinions here in terms of, was this person trying to save Yusuf or was this person trying to actually make like uh, like pushing the scheme forward even more? I don't think that conversation matters that much because whether this brother who suggested this wanted good for Yusuf or not, at the end of the day, throwing an eight-year-old in a well where no one's going to find them for three, four, five days, it basically is as if you kill them. Like, I don't think it really makes a difference all that much, but that's how terrible group thing can get. That's how terrible unbride, unchecked emotions when you have, uh, um, can, can really uh, take someone. Um, and they, that's what they suggest is throw him into it. Uh, and maybe بعض السيارتي إن كنتم فائلين. Maybe um, a caravan can come and maybe they'll pick him up. It's not even that they will definitely, a caravan will come pick him up. Maybe we don't have to deal with him anymore because either he'll die in the well or um, a caravan will take care of him and they'll just do something with him. And also what worse fate can you think about? Like some random dudes who are, who have a caravan who all their only mindset is business. They'll pick him up. I'm sure that's going to lead to a great life. No, this wasn't out of pity. This is out of like the most convenient thing that could be done. The most logical thing that could be done for them. Throw him into a well. We'll just leave him there. Um, do you guys mind if we go go for 10 more minutes? Awesome. Exactly. Um, so that's the end of conversation one. There's going to be two conversations. The second conversation is not as in-depth, but we're, uh, we're going to understand the second conversation. That uh, first conversation, again, remember, is a direct parallel out of the conversation between Yusuf and his father. Beautiful conversation that leads to a lifelong awesomeness. Other second conversation between the brothers also going to le lead to what they thought was a lifelong amazing thing that they're putting together. But unfortunately, it does the opposite. It's something that literally haunt, will haunt them for the rest of their lives until the, this action is all corrected. Um, that's what happened. And now what happens? Now it's time to get Yusuf. We know what to do. They're all, the, all the stages have been set. The villain, the heroes have been established. The villains have been established. Now they finally come in contact with each other. Um, if I was making a movie, this is when the cut would happen. And then I would ha have one, I mean, not that I've thought this too much through, one uh, scene would fade this way, the other scene would fade this way, and now it would be in the middle. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's how I would uh, put it together. Um, they say to their father, Ya Abana, very contrasty from how Yusuf salam talked to his father. He said, Ya Abati. They say, Ya Abana. Big difference. This is just, oh, father. This isn't, oh, my father, I love you. This is, hey, dad. Malaka. What's wrong with you? That's literally what that translates to. What's wrong with you? La ta'manna ala Yusuf. You don't trust us with Yusuf? Inna lahu nasifun. The reason I say a cut has taken place, even though we wish him well, a cut has taken place. They've probably tried a couple of times to hear already. They've probably tried to get use of a couple of times. Like this isn't, a pa some passage of time has taken place already. They've been like, hey, can you let, let him come with us? Father's like, no, no, no. He makes up an excuse. No, he's sick today. Oh, he's not strong enough to go with you, with you guys. Like there's, they've probably tried a bunch of times. Then his, uh, the kids actually are guilt tripping their father. Malaka, what's wrong with you? Or what's wrong with us? You don't trust us. There's a guilt that's being played. Oh, you you don't think we like him, but we really like him. We wish him well. 
they're wearing down his resilience and making Yaqub feel what? Like Yaqub is wrong, not that they're wrong. Yaqub, I remember we said he's a prophet of Allah. He's a really good father. He knows his children to the point where he wasn't afraid to tell Yusuf, don't tell your brothers because your brothers might plan against you. So he knows that they could, they're capable of this. But now they're kind of wearing him down to the point of like, oh, you don't trust us? And parents want to trust their children. Like, I, I tell you that if the worst thing a parent wants to hear from their child is, don't you even love me? Don't you even think I could do anything? At that point, the conversation goes away from what I know of my child to, oh my gosh, am I a good parent? Maybe I'm the issue. Oh no. That's what the children are doing to Yaqub at this point. And then they continue to even say, Send us tomorrow. If you want to prove that you love us, if you want to prove that you know that we're capable, if you want to prove that you're a good father even, send him with us tomorrow. This is the tactic that uh, car salesmen use to sell cars. I remember I, I bought my first car a couple of years ago. And in the dealership, like I made the biggest mistake of having my family with me. It's like, your family wants to go home, just sign it. <laughs> you can sign it tomorrow. You can do it like, they're terrible. They'll use every piece of information that they can gather in order to upsell you something <laughs> or force you to sign a paper. Um, the exact same thing that's being done here. They use, these are manipulation tactics. Tomorrow, send them with us. If you, do you agree with our statement? Moment of weakness. No, no, no. I can almost imagine that his, they say, "What? don't you trust us? It's like, no, his father goes, no, no, I trust you. I trust you guys. I know you guys are capable. Then send him with us tomorrow. Like, there's this quickness that they have of a manipulation. He's going to yartha. Yartha is typically like, it's not it's going to eat. He's going to graze. It's like how, like, cattle and stuff eat they eat to the point where they're like their stomachs are bursting right yeah i thought he's gonna really eat he's gonna really play and we'll be watching him we'll be watching over him i could imagine a father like yaqub is like you know maybe i was wrong maybe they do want good for him maybe they do want to just take him out i know that they are capable of harm but maybe this time isn't it i want my kids to get along Okay, go. Ayah 13. Qala inni la yahzununi. He might have given in. Allah doesn't actually confirm that he said, okay, you can go. But that seems to be implied that somehow they got him. But as he's leaving, he goes and gives them this one last thing. It's almost as if he's had a change of heart. You know how that sometimes happens? Or like you say reluctantly yes, but in your heart you're like, ah. I said yes, but now I can't go back on my word. It's like one of those. <laughs> the thought of you taking him away, <laughs> it makes me just really sad. That <laughs> Like, I'm just really sad that that's happening. Um, it actually doesn't worry me. It makes me depressed is actually the more proper word. Um, and I fear that a wolf, not a wolf, the wolf, it's not ذئبن, الذئبن, we'll talk about that in a second, um, is, is going to get him when you're not paying attention. His father um, says, Yaqub says something very intelligent here. One, the first thing I want to focus on is he says, it, the thought of it depresses me. That's a weird thing to say. Because you don't get sad about something that's going to happen in the future. What do you get sad about stuff that happened that happened in the past, right? But I personally think the Quran does this a lot. Uses the term takhaf and tahzan. Takhaf is fear. Fear is about what happens in the future. Tahzan is what happens. Sadness is about what happens in the past. Why would Yaqub be tahzan and not takhaf twice? My personal theory on this. And this, I, I can't have any Quran or anything to confirm this, but this is more of a, 
Um, my understanding of also the Prophet some sometimes uses the term that tahzan. And he the very famously Abu Bakr who and the Prophet are in a cave. And the Prophet tells Abu Bakr, La tahzan in Allah ma'na. Don't be depressed, Allah is with us. Normally they say, don't be afraid. The reason he says that is Abu Bakr was a planner. He plans everything like crazy. So the planners are really cool, but they also have a very, very big weakness. When they fear, they fear as if it's already happened. Like they, they internalize it already. For them, so the example of the Prophet and Abu Bakr in a cave, right? And they're going to get caught. Abu Bakr who's already thinking, what about all the people in Medina? What about all the people who are in the way? What's going to happen to the Prophet after they capture us? Oh no. And this, and this, like he's going on and on. He's, his mind is racing at a million miles per hour. Some of us do that as well. The, the worst case scenario, the situation hasn't happened yet, but we've already internalized every outcome. I know uh, mothers do this a lot. There's a reason why when you leave your house and you're not home for an hour, you get 38 missed calls. Not that I'm speaking from experience or anything. Because they're not thinking, oh, he must be late. You know what they've done? Someone took him. There was a car accident. He must be in the hospital. What am I going to do when they're in the hospital? How are they going to, how's that, how are they, like, what type of mother am I? How am I going to care for him? Which room will they take? Because they can't go upstairs anymore. Like this is, all of these weird realities start like being painted in their head, right? Um, and what are they doing at the end of the day? They're that they're they've processed already what depression, even though what's actually happening it's a fear. Yaqub alayhi salam has already done this, and this is actually what each of our parents do to us. This is what we do to our sibling. This is what we do. Anyone you care about, this is what would you do to them? Like when the slightest thing goes wrong, your mind goes racing. And you're actually experiencing almost this panic attack. And that's what the tahzanani is. That depression you feel in that moment. Man, I feel this. Like I'm feeling it. He's making one final appeal to them. They're like, I'm really feeling this right now. And I fear the wolf will eat him. Normally when you'd say, I fear a wolf would eat him. But he says the wolf will eat him. I think Yaqub Islam here is being extremely smart with his words because he's not talking about the wolf outside. He might be referring figuratively to the wolf inside each of them. I fear the wolf may eat him. When you guys aren't paying attention. When someone's doing a sin, typically they're ghafil. Their actual heart isn't alive because they attribute all bad to shaitan. That's one of the reasons we attribute all bad to shaitan. You're not actually alive. You're capable of good. The darkness just took over. When you weren't aware. I personally see Yaqub is speaking in coded language here in order to make one final appeal at his kids. They didn't take it. The next ayah, and I'm sorry I'm covering a bunch of ayahs together, but next ayah. You think the wolf can eat them? When we're these strong, capable people, inna uh, idhan we'd la be, We'd be complete losers. We let that happen. They all know full well what they're about to do. And there's also an, an irony in the way they said it. You know what the irony is? You think a wolf? You think a wolf will eat him when we're there? What does that mean? You don't need a wolf. We're here. You don't need a wolf for something bad to happen to them. We're here. That's also what they just said. I know that's not what they meant, but this is where sometimes, you know, like um, we call them Freudian slips where the actual intent comes out in weird ways, right? Of your speech. I would say this is one of those. It's a slip of their, their mouth. We don't need a wolf. We're here. Like a wolf doesn't need to do them harm. We can do him harm. That's not what they meant. They meant to kind of reassure him in a very bad way. But that seems to be the, the, their choice of words. Remember, when we think about details that Allah puts in the Quran, every word and every letter matters. Allah wouldn't have made it sound that way if that's not one of the meanings that's kind of being put out there. Um, in, uh, it, uh, and then the other idea, we would be losers. They're almost stealing their fate. 
there's conversations sometimes that like play over and over and over in your head. I would assume this would be one of those conversations because we're going to get into the psychology of the brothers later on too. They're going to get super sad about this. Like it'll cut to them and they're, they're going to be like, oh my God, I wish we just didn't do that. I wish we wouldn't do that. And they're probably, they'd probably be looking back at this conversation again. Oh, we had said it. Both of these things are extremely figurative right now. Um, my apologies, I've been talking for a while and I just sped through three ayat, um, but your thoughts. Excuse me. Um, what was the, what was the term you used with where inadvertently like saying something that, that they intended? A, a, a Freudian slip. Freud, Freudian? Like yeah. Sigmund Freud? Like Sigmund Freud. And the idea behind it is uh, your unconscious, parts of your unconscious actually come out in your verbal speech, even though you didn't intend them to. And in, again, it's the Freudian theory of like most of your actions are based on your subconscious state rather than uh, your conscious state. Uh, but you just pretend like your conscious state is actually what's, what's uh, controlling you. You said something about how when we do bad things, we're dead and like our shaitan is. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah. Um, so... One of the things that we think about is that the human beings are inherently good. They just get clouded, that there is light inside of every single person. There's a fitra inside of every single person. And when they don't allow that fitra to come out, like we still think it's in there somewhere. And that's the idea of like, but we're unaware of it. We're choosing to ignore our light or we're unaware that we have that light initially in there. And that's kind of that you're unaware. Like his father's almost saying like, if there is a dark tendencies you guys have, it's not your fault. I just haven't cleaned it. You're just unaware of, um, uh, 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 unaware. That's, that's just what's, what's happening. Does that, does that kind of clear it up? So your heart initially calls you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It calls you towards righteous action at all times. You just, it's too clouded. You don't hear it. Your passions have taken over. That's not really you. That's shaitan playing with your passions. That's shaitan playing with your lack of information. All of that is what's going on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Ignorant, ignore it. That's, 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 a, <laughs> that's pretty good, Ryan. Um, never really thought about it that way. Um, any, other, any other comments before we conclude for today? My apologies for going a bit over. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Alid. I don't know if you addressed it. Sorry, I was running all over the house. But so my question was, um, so we know that the brothers are insecure, which leads to arrogance, right? And in the most general sense, I'm sure every human being has insecurities to an extent. So in order to apply this to our lives, how would you suggest that, how would you su suggest that the what, what the brothers should have done in order to avoid those insecurities from taking over their lives or mm -hmm. combating those insecurities in general? SubhanAllah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to answer it two ways. One is I'm going to say that uh, sometimes there might not be an actual appropriate solution. What I mean by that is like hindsight is 2020, but oftentimes struggle is the only way to get through an issue. So I wanted to put that out there because like, I don't want to say the use of brother should have just done this because like Allah tells the best of stories and Allah made the best of situations. So this was apparently the best that could have happened, right? But with that said, um, I would say the it's the foil of Yusuf. Yusuf is feeling insecure. I don't know what this dream means. What does he say? He tells his father, I don't get it. I really don't get it. And his father tells him. Same thing would be for if, if his brother is like, hey, we don't feel like we're loved. It would be talk to their father. Talk to him directly. We kind of feel like you prefer Yusuf over us. And his father would then have the ability of saying, I, of course I don't. Like I could imagine Yaqub again, I don't want to speak for him, but I could imagine I, I, I could imagine what a good father would say, of course not, I love you all equally, but the way I show my love might be different. Don't you remember, and then I'd point to each one of them, don't you remember when you broke your arm and I stayed up all night next to you? Don't you remember when this happened? Don't you, like, that's what I assume would probably take place, right? A clarification, kind of what is your misgiving? What haven't you understood properly? Why, and the father would even probably, a really good father, which Yaqub is, would probably be like, oh guys, I'm really sorry if you guys feel this way. Let me know how we can fix it. Like it'd be one of those exchanges. That's what would probably have to happen. Or it could be that the brothers, instead of just conferring against each other, 
Like, don't just talk to people who feel the same way as you. Talk to people who what who feel differently than you. And when they challenge you, you don't say shut up. And that's unfortunately what happens sometimes. And this is also the idea of like who we should keep as friends. We shouldn't just keep the friends. And the other idea of, you know, when you're being a bad friend or you have a friend who's maybe not the best for you is when you try to correct them, like, hey, quiet. If you open your mouth now, you, we know might no longer be friends. That's not a good friend. Like, it, it isn't. <laughs> your company is supposed to be, it should have been able to challenge you in a proper way. Um, same thing kind of happens here. What should have probably taken place is talk to people who'd be able to challenge them, express their insecurity, and ideally express the insecurity with the one who you're feeling insecure to, which would be their father. Um, so, Hale, I see your hand up. I just had a question. So, does part of Prajal Sangam come to see you? For example. Um, so, Hale, it's very good to uh, have you with us. Yeah. Um, the question is, does this part relate to what the Prophet Sallallahu is going through with his own family at the moment, or just anything that's going on at the time of Revelation? Sort of how does it, you know, trace back to that? Definitely. This was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu in the year of sadness. Um, Zishan was here last week, actually, and he said something interesting. The best of seer of Surah Yusuf is the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu has brothers, the Quraysh, right? Who they don't want to give up their lifestyle. They're his brothers. They're his family. They don't want to give up their lifestyle. Why? Because the prophet was chosen. And inherently, there's a bit of jealousy with, between, in, between them. Like, oh gosh, he's a prophet amongst us now. Like there were literally tribes in Mecca who are like, oh, it's the Banu Hashim again. Everything good just happens to them. And now this happened. Like this rivalry and stuff is happening all throughout the Quraysh in Mecca. And this story seems to be like literally diagnosing their hearts. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, I saw a question um, uh, the, the, grammatically. There you are, Amina. Um, in ayah number 11, this is actually a really cool thing. Um, in ayah number 11, uh, there's, it says, um, um, there's four or five different ways to recite this, depending on which recitation you recite. But in the Hafs recitation, what you're supposed to say is la, la man, uh, uh, manna, in which you make a ghunna. What this actually says in Arabic is la ta manna, la ta manuna. But it gets put in as la ta manna, and you see that little like diamond shape. Um, what that's supposed to signify is actually an uh, exemplification of, uh, of kind of what's of, of trust right there. It's not trust us, it's trust each one of us. La ta manuna. That's actually what's being said, but it puts put, put together is that manna. And that's why you wouldn't say that manna, you'd say that manna. I know it's a little bit of a thing and you're supposed to actually make the dhamma with your mouth when you recite it. Um, so that's that's what it is, is it all, it's not the statement that was just made once. It was a statement that was made over and over and over again. Um, and this would be, this is why I say it was emotional manipulation. Like each one of them is like, you don't trust us, but we do so much work. You don't trust us. How dare you not trust us? Like he's, he's making him feel bad as a father. Like they're making them feel bad as a father. That's all encaptured within uh, the Amanna. Um, I hope that, uh, Wayak, I hope that answers that question. Jazakallah to everyone for, for being a part of this. Shadbun, I see your hand is raised. Sorry, I thought you were going to conclude. Um, just a little quick, quick thing that I've kind of found cool is that, um, within the whole entire uh, scenario that we read today, I kind of find it cool that even within the house of a prophet, there's like different levels of sins that was going through from manipulation to killing to throwing. So instead of killing, you just throw them down a, a well and then see what happens. I just found it really cool that um, that, that it still existed like within this that household. Yeah, um, there, there's two actually interesting parts about that, which I think we'll conclude with. In the household of a prophet can be this much sin. And in the and on the other side, the whole story of Yusuf and Islam is what? In the worst possible environments, in the uh, house of a politician, in a prison full of criminals, there can be someone as amazing as Yusuf. So 
beautiful, amazing environments can have amazing people and terrible people. Terrible environments can have terrible people and amazing people. We're not supposed to judge an environment or judge the products um, just because of a false pre preconceived notion of what society has labeled something. I think it's a beautiful thing that's found all throughout the story. And we'll be exploring that in Shallow the next couple of weeks that we're together. Um, Zach and everyone, we were able to make it. We, we went a little over, but we were able to make it to item number 14. Um, next week when we're together, we'll try to get through about 14 through 18 or so, 14 through 20 if we're really lucky or really productive, inshallah. Um, but uh, I, I, I really appreciate all of you being there. And I'm hoping that as we're going through this, we start reflecting even on our own sibling rivalries that we've had, how we interact with our parents and our families around us. We recognize that yes, family can cut us deeper than anyone else can. That's one of the stories that's really found here. That doesn't mean we abandon them though. Um, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that when we read the ayat of the Quran, that we are sa'il, that we know that we need them so that we can get guidance from them. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be amongst those that get the lessons that are supposed to be found within these surahs, so that these eternal conversations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saves, that there's guidance in it for all of our current conditions. Ameen ya rabbal alameen. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum